Thank you so much for streaming our latest message from First Baptist Church. Here at FBC, our mission is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. We do that by thinking big, thinking small, thinking in, and thinking out. We hope that this message helps you as you continue to grow in your faith. If you would like to stay connected to FBC, you can visit our website at fbcloyd.ca, look us up on Facebook and Instagram, or download our free mobile app. Now here's the latest from FBC. Enjoy. Thanks guys. What an awesome song. What an awesome morning. I see that some of you are back for more of our You Asked For It series. Hope you guys enjoyed week one. I actually want to take, take a second to say we, uh, we got a lot of positive feedback and encouragement from you guys over the past week on last week. And um, I'm not saying that to like solicit that, but I just want to say like, thank you so much. We really appreciate that. We really do cherish those words. Maybe sometimes it doesn't seem like that big of a deal to you, but it is really encouraging. I mean, we're also open to not positive feedback. I mean, Doug's door is always open, but... Um, <laughs> But I just want to say thank you. It is really cool to be part of a church where we feel that kind of support over the week. Um, we are going to hop into some more questions. Got some big questions again today. Um, maybe more or less controversial. I don't know. It's up to you. I guess it depends who you are. Um, but we're excited to tackle some of those. Really quickly want to just throw out a couple quick thoughts before we hop into this. First of all, like I said last week at FBC, we are a church that firmly and passionately believes in the Bible and holds to what the Bible says on issues of spirituality and morality and theology. Um, and, and, and so that's our basis for everything. We're just trying to be our, do our best to be diligent with that and responsible with what the Bible has to say. Uh, everything we're going to answer, we're going to do so with as much grace and tact and compassion as we can while firmly holding to what we believe the Bible teaches about things. Again, we're giving short answers. Uh, like I said last week, the, the, this, to us, this is a conversation. If you have more questions, you don't like something we said, you want to talk about it more, our doors are always open. You can hit us up on social media or call us or wh whatever works for you. Um, today uh, is a little bit different because last week mostly we were commenting on what the Bible says about things. Today we're getting a little bit more into kind of some of the opinion-driven territory. So again, uh, don't hear any of this coming as condemning. I know people often get offended when they hear people say opinions that are different than how they live their lives or what they think. I don't think there's any reason to get uh, offended just because we think something differently. We're going to do our best to be diligent stewards of what the Bible says and share some opinions there. Um, we can keep the conversation going. You can choose to disagree with us. That's cool. Um, just hear us with grace this morning, we'd ask. Um, before we get into it, maybe Doug, if you wouldn't mind, just open us up in prayer and then we'll dive in. Let's pray. Father, this morning again, we stop and we say thank you. Thank you. God, that you are interested in our lives. Thank you that you have plans for our lives, and thank you that you've made yourself known to us through your word and even in through uh, settings such as this where we can come together corporately. And so, Lord, as we uh, go into some of these questions, as we talk about some of these uh, issues, just ask God that you would guide and direct us, that you would help us to hear from you today, uh, that you would speak to us individually, um, and so that we would be able to know you better, understand you more, and be more like you. And again, I would just ask these things in your son's name and for his sake. Amen. Hey, uh, just before we get going, going Ryan, uh, I got a question. Calling an audible? Going for it. Okay. My prerogative. I'm scared. Um, who, who, what church has the most awesome youth group in all the land? Yeah, well... <laughs> <laughs> Are you clapping for Doug? Or I haven't even answered yet. Um, you know, uh, I know it's like every church should say their own, but like I cannot tell you how firmly and strongly I believe that it's FBC, and not just because there are students here and be awkward to say some other youth group like my old church I used to go to or something like that. Um, I uh, and I'll tell you why. So I don't know if any of you noticed, but on Friday it rained a bit. Okay, um, if you didn't notice, you weren't driving. Um, and uh, I think God decided we needed a bigger baptism tank here at FBC, so he turned the fireside room and the volunteer lounge and the kid lounge into a baptism tank, and it was a party. It was Gord called me, and he said, hey, you know, we need some, we need some help here. And um, so I sent out a couple quick text messages. Probably within 15 minutes, there were probably 20 to 25 of our high school students here hauling like garbage pails full of water, mopping, shop vacuuming, moving stuff. And they were here for probably four and a half hours on Friday night just working their butts off. And we, we truly do have the most amazing students in our youth group in, in the world. Yeah, let's hear it for them. Now, 
there were adults here as well, and we have awesome adults as well, but I want to take a second to recognize our students because when I was in high school, uh, if I got a text on a Friday night, well, I wouldn't have gotten a text on a Friday night because I'm too old for that to have been possible, but if I got a text on a Friday night and said, hey, you want to spend your Friday night cleaning the church and emptying? Well, no way. Absolutely not, okay? Um, our students are awesome. Our Think Big opportunity, in case you didn't notice in the bulletin this week, which I hope you did, because I hope you're reading those thinking, hey, what are cool new ways I can think big? Um, but uh, if you didn't read it, it's about getting involved with our youth. And it really is what we believe is an opportunity. We're not just looking for your help. We're not looking for you to fill the space. It's an opportunity because we're giving you the opportunity uh, to partner with some of the most amazing students that this world has to offer. And God is working in their lives in incredible ways. And, and I guarantee you, if you get involved with youth, what you'll find is that you'll be able to invest in ways that you'll never regret, but you'll also have your life challenged and <laughs> shaped by some of our amazing youth as they convict you in the ways that you pursue Jesus. So um, yeah, I could talk about that forever. So anyways, let's... Uh, <laughs> Let's get to some of the real questions that didn't just come from Doug. Okay, um, last week we started with kind of the easier questions and then turned up the heat and went, to, so I thought we'd hop right into the fire, go with like a really hard, intense question right off the bat. So someone sent in, they said, I've been wondering whether or not Adam had a belly button. Can anybody help me? So Doug, maybe you could field this one. You, you were okay. around then, so, so you, yeah. <laughs> so as I, as I think back on it, um, of course, belly buttons uh, are to do with the umbilical cord. Before we get need. into another birds and the bees talk with Doug, which is, uh, I'll maybe, I, I want to show you guys the rest of the question. This came from Mark Breitkreitz, and he said, this is a cool idea, guys, praying it's a great series for you as a church. If you know Mark Breitkreitz, he used to work here a few years ago, and unfortunately he quit, which really worked out well for me because then I got a job, but... Uh, <laughs> Now he's the regional director of our denomination. He sent this in. So I'd invite you both to pray for Mark because uh, this is what he's sending in. But also just to take a second to appreciate how cool it is that we have a regional director as a lot of churches he's overseen who cares about what's going on. He's praying for us and he's seeing what we're doing. So it's pretty cool. Next time you see Mark, make sure you poke him in the belly button and give him a hug. So, All right, let's get to some real questions. Okay. Um, okay, three questions came in kind of like this. It says, how do I find out what God's will is for my life? How do I wait on the Lord and trust in his direction? How do you know if God is calling or has called you to do something? So these questions and some others that were sent in, and we're trying to answer a lot of the questions that a lot of people asked. Um, these are kind of pointing towards understanding and following God's will. And so, Talisi, maybe you could tell us how you would respond to these kinds of questions. Yeah, sure. This is, there's a lot going on here with this question. Um, I think if you kind of boil it down, um, what this person is sort of asking is just, you know, how do I understand what God is saying to me? Um, so if I were to ask God, uh, how do you want me to proceed in this situation? What path do you want me to take? Um, how do you know how God is responding? Um, and so I think um, I'll touch on a few points, but I think it begins with something very, very simple. And that's just um, taking the time to look at and understand what God has already said to all of us through the Bible. Um, so that might seem almost too simple, almost even a little bit cliche, just read your Bible. Um, but I really believe that understanding God's will for our lives begins with a genuine desire to hear from God. And the best way to learn how to do that is simply to read his word and understand who he is and what he's already said to all of us as Christians about how he wants us to live our lives. So I think we need to be diligent to read what his word is saying. And then we also need to be diligent to apply that to our lives. Um, and we need to be putting that into practice. I mean, if you think about what God has given us here, he's given us these amazing directives and um, just such rich wisdom right here in the Bible. And if, if we're ignoring that or we're not taking the time to put that into practice in our lives, why should we expect that God would somehow then give us this additional or more specific direction if we're not listening to what he's already said to us and, and the direction he's already given all of us. So I think we need to be careful to be doing that. And when we're doing that, then we can start to weigh um, our ideas and our questions about maybe what God is saying to us against what his word says. And, and we can evaluate how it lines up with God's word. We can ask questions like, well, you know, how would doing this line up with what the Bible says about how I should live? Um, how would following this path Path, honor God based on what I know about his um, character um, as, and his values as I've read about in the Bible. So we need to evaluate that against his word. A simple basic example would just be to think about 
um, how Jesus has given us the Great Commission in, in Matthew 28, and he says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy, Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So we know right there that God has a will for all of us that we're making disciples, we're teaching people how to follow him. And so if, you, if you've ever been in this position where you're thinking, I, I feel like maybe God is calling me to step out of my comfort zone a little bit and maybe become a small group leader where I'm deciding discipling some kids or some students, some adults even, um, or I've been feeling like lately God's tugging on my heart and, and asking me to talk to a coworker about my faith. Um, but I'm just not sure if that's God. I don't know how that would go. I think it's really simple to just look in the Bible and understand that, well, this, yes, this lines up with what God's will for all of us as believers is to make disciples and to teach people to follow him. So we need to do that. Um, I think then also just to touch on this idea of um, how do I wait on the Lord and trust his direction? I would just say this. Um, I think it's easy to look at this idea of waiting as being a very passive activity. And that, um, you know, I don't know exactly what God wants me to do. So right now I'm not really doing anything. And I'm just kind of waiting for that specific instruction. Um, I, I would really caution people against that. Um, personally, I believe that waiting on the Lord is a very active process. It's this dynamic pursuit of God. And um, in order to be waiting on the Lord, we need to be just seeking after him. We need to be digging into his word to understand what he's saying to us, spending time in prayer, engaging in conversation with God. And then also we need to be getting our hands dirty and actually participating in the work of his kingdom. And so we need to start serving. And, and you might think, well, I don't know where God wants me to serve. I don't know what he wants me to do. I think it's okay to just start somewhere. Um, you know, you can talk to one of us on staff and we'd be happy to help you find a place to, to just get get started, get your feet wet, because I think that sometimes God is asking us to just um, take a first step of obedience where we start to uh, start to apply what he's already asked us to do through his word and start to serve. And when we do that, then he will reveal the next step and the next step. I think as people, we want to see the whole map of our lives laid out before us, and that's what we expect from God as him revealing his will. But I think sometimes he's just saying, just take a step, and then I'm going to reveal the next step and the next step. It reminds me of um, Proverbs 3, 6, which just says, if we acknowledge God in all our ways, then he will make our path straight. So I think if we're pursuing him actively, we're engaging with him, even in the times of waiting, then he will direct our path in a way that we can't miss it. Yeah, that's really good. I don't know why we keep getting people up here with better answers than us, Doug. <laughs> Next week, week three, just Doug and me, no one else. <laughs> Maybe we'll get Barry up here. He'd make us look good. Okay. Um, I really agree with that. I think that's so simple, yet so profound. Um, I'll be really honest. My personal experience, you know, I've read stories in the Bible where God is showing up and telling people specific things to do. I've talked to people who are saying, you know, God really called me to do this specific thing. And in my personal life experience, I've read the Bible, I've prayed, I'm pursuing Jesus, and I haven't really had any of those big moments where like a bush gets lit on fire or, or a donkey starts talking to me or I feel like this strong leading like, Ryan, you have to do this or this or this. But I do feel like God has been directing my steps and has been turning me into someone who is more Christ-like. I kind of think about it like this. I kind of think about, you know, if I got a new job and my boss came up to me and gave me a to-do list of 20 items. If I went away and I did two or three of those items, checked them off, and I came back to my boss and said, what do you want me to do now? Well, he would say, like, uh, the other 17 or 18 items that you haven't done, right? Like, it'd be pretty simple. I think we miss that a lot with God. Um, and it might be that all your coworkers have the same to-do list, and that's fine. With God, we can trust that his, his kind of corporate calling that he's offered us through scripture is good and it's sound. And that boss loves you and cares about you. And they, he might show up sometimes and say, I want to add something to this list. I want to, you know, change this. I want to be a part of, you know, this is going to look a little bit different than you originally thought. Well, one thing that really gets me, and this might sound a little harsh, but one thing that really gets me is I hear a lot of people, a lot of Christians ask these questions. But a lot of times those are the same people who haven't read the whole Bible, or who aren't spending time regularly reading the Bible. And we want God to speak when he has, and we're not, we're not willing to listen to him. 
So what's God to do when we say, I'm not really willing to listen to the words you've already given me, but I want some words from you. I want you to, you know, we kind of have this sensational idea about our lives. Like we're Mo, we want to be Moses or Jonah, which you actually don't want to be those guys. Their lives are brutal. But, uh, you know, I want to be Moses or Jonah where this crazy thing happens. We're not content in the simplicity of, of what God might be calling us to that's already so good and so complete. And if he shows up and, and directs some steps in some certain ways, that's great, and you follow him. But I think we need to be content in a calling like mine where I've just felt like, you know, I've read Scripture and God's led me, and, and, and that's, uh, that's been really cool. I, I think we take verses like Jeremiah 29, 11, and we kind of try to make it mean more than it does. You know, I know the plans I have for you. And we, we think that means God needs to pick out what color of socks we wear, or if we wear socks, and if we wear the same socks we've worn for the last seven days, and which job we should have, and, and things like that, you know. And uh, it's it's not guaranteed in the scripture, but there are things that are, and I think we need to pay attention to those first before we could possibly expect God to show up and say more. I just think it's kind of unreasonable to do that. Um, okay, so anyways, um, we're going to move on to this next category here. This next category kind of all has to do with giving and tithing, but we'll start with this first question. This question says, what were the Old Testament tithes actually for? Why do we still stick to that 10% today? I think it makes sense as a rule of thumb, but why don't we say Christians should give even more than that since the New Testament seems to teach giving much more sacrificially than that? Now, I'm going to take this like very popular to talk about on stage question, and Doug, since you're my least favorite person up here, I'll let you have it. So, <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, th- thanks again. Uh, okay, so um, with regard to what the tithe was in the Old Testament, what, what, what it was for, I think it's really important, we always want to remember that the tithe, tithe was, first of all, a worship offering to God. It was a worship offering to God. We, we tend sometimes to skip over that part and go immediately to the, to, to the uh, point where God directed the tithe to be given to the Levites. Okay, and the Levites were one of the tribes that did not get an inheritance of, the, of land as the Israelites moved into the promised land. Instead, God said, I'll give you the tithe, the tithe, the worship offering that's been given to me. I'll direct it back to you in place of that inheritance. And so it went to the Levites and for the upkeep and the maintenance and and the working of the tabernacle. So that's historically what it was. Now, as, as, as we get to the New Testament times and as we get into the question about how does that work in relation to New Testament, there's a debate about that. Some would argue that when Christ came, that he over, he fulfilled the law. And, and so, therefore, the law is done. Uh, the Mosaic law that the tithe was implemented under is finished. Others would turn around and say, well, but Christ himself, in, in places like Matthew 23, 23, endorsed the tithe. And so then the tithe still applies in the New Testament. I think that oftentimes what happens is when we get into that discussion about whether this is a requirement and how much it is and, and the, the legalities of it and so on, we miss the point um, and we get distracted. And I think what we want to look at is the fact that it's the heart of it that's where we really want to focus on and what we want to try and understand. My dad always used to teach me, um, whenever you want to find out how serious somebody is about a subject, find a way to involve cash, and you'll find out where their heart's at, where they're really at with regard to that topic. And, and I kind of think that's a bit of a biblical principle. Uh, I think God does that with us. Except for in his case, it's not a question of him finding out where our hearts are at because he already knows. But he gives us that directive so that we can then find out where our hearts are at. And as we start to look at it and we start to, to examine whether or not I'm good with this whole idea of giving uh, or, or tithing, um, or if I'm going to balk, if I'm going to start and, and argue with that, then that gives me a really good clue as to where my heart is at with God. And so... Um, you know, in places like Malachi 3, where Christ comes along, God comes along, and he says, hey, test me in this. You give to me, give to me, and test me in this, and see if I don't show up. And that's Old Testament, I get it, but I don't think God's changed. I think that applies in the New Testament. And so when we get to places in the New Testament where it's calling us to a much higher standard than just a 10% tithe, places like Acts 2, where it says, sell your land and your possessions and give to those that have need, then... I think that that's just this, not, it's not a requirement anymore, it's this opportunity. We wander through life so oftentimes wondering about whether or not God is real. Is he, is he really there? Does he really have some sort of a bearing in my world? Does he, how do I know this is legit? 
And we never take this opportunity to, to engage with him and have him show up in our lives and demonstrate that he is real and he is here and he's, he's involved and he's got power. He, like he's the creator. And so, um, so I would say, look at this as an opportunity so that we can then get to where we want to be like in the New Testament, where we are like the, the Acts Church and we're giving to those that have need up to and including selling our possessions and our land so that we can, we can cover that off. Hmm. Yeah, that's, 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 that's another reason, just as an addendum. Uh, we've done this before in the past. We did the 90-day the tithe challenge. And you might not have been around for that, um, but we, still, we can still do it now. We, and basically what it is is this. As a church, we'll come along and we'll say, if you want to try this, if you want to engage with God, take him up on his challenge, then you give. Tithe for 90 days. Start with 10%. That's where I think it starts. I think we start with 10% and we, we grow into the giving after that. Start with 10% for 90 days and see if God shows up in your life. If he does, great. Then awesome. Keep going. If for whatever reason you decide he doesn't, he hasn't showed up, then you let us know. We'll give you your money back. 100% guaranteed. Now, there's some requirements of that so that we can make sure that we do that properly and that there's no question about that. So you need to talk to, to, talk to one of us and we can get you hooked up with, um, with um, Ron and he can get the, the things in place. But man, I'd, I'd encourage you. To see it as an opportunity and engage with him. Yeah, and it's a really cool opportunity. One thing I want to say too, just to quickly add to that, if you do decide to do it, it is a very confidential thing. I know people have taken the 90 day ties challenge here. I don't know the name of a single person who's taken it. So you really just need to touch base with Ron. Um, if you don't know who he is, you can talk to one of us and we can, but it is really like between you, Ron, the bank and God. Um, and, uh, and if you don't know who Ron is, then that's great because it's some dude you don't know. But um, yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's money back guarantee, so give it a shot. Um, okay, kind of on the same topic, but, you know, a lot of times people kind of categorize tithing and giving, so we'll move kind of more into the giving side. Tell us, I have a question for you. How can Christians figure out how to balance living a North American lifestyle with giving generously? How can we know what is too much to spend on holidays, vehicles, hobbies, fashion, entertainment, and other discretionary spending when there are children who are dying for lack of the basic necessities? Yeah, that's a great question. That's a hard question question to answer and just very challenging, very convicting even as I consider my own life. Um, because I think that if we look at the life of Jesus, who whose life is who we as Christians should be obviously trying to model ourselves after, um, you really don't see a whole lot of that balance of luxury and, um, and generosity. I think Jesus' life was all about giving. Ryan, I've heard you say countless times that Jesus had this terminal illness known as generosity. He basically just gave and gave and gave until one day it ultimately cost him his life. And, and so Jesus' life really calls us to this higher standard of self-sacrifice and, and a willingness to consider the needs of others above our own comforts and desires and, and luxury. And so it, it is a very challenging question um, to answer. Um, and I think that, you know, we need to, kind of like what Doug was saying, be willing to check our hearts and check our motives when it comes to to these questions. Um, I think too we need to look at you know what exactly is the North America the average North American lifestyle. Um, when you think about that, you realize that most North Americans are within the top one percent of the richest people on the planet. And even those of us who are considered poor here in North America would be considered rich compared to a lot of people in the world. And we also need to acknowledge the fact that the average North American isn't necessarily concerned with the things that God is concerned with. And so if we're modeling our lives after the average North American lifestyle, we need to be careful to realize that these that's not necessarily lining up with what, what God is concerned with. Um, so we need to think about those things. We need to realize that, you know, often we characterize um, the average North American lifestyle as kind of keeping up with the Joneses. And, and that can easily become a trap where we're just concerned with having more and more and more and looking more like the person next to me and my neighbors and all of that. And we, we need to be careful. And so we need to be asking questions where we check our hearts um, and where we are willing to say, you know, how, um, what, what does God's, what is God's will for my life in this area? What does the Bible say about this particular area of my life? How can I, how can I glean from the Bible something that will help me navigate this balance? And even is balance what I should be striving to attain in this particular area of my life? So we need to ask those questions. Um, 
so yeah, is it wrong to spend on those things? I certainly wouldn't say so, and I don't think that that's what Jesus would have said either. Um, but I do think what Jesus did with his life was that he called us to this more excellent way. He showed us a more excellent way, and he asked people to check their hearts, and he asked people to be asking, where, where are my priorities? Um, I think of Matthew 6.24 where he says, no one, can, um, no one can serve two masters. Either you will love one and hate the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. No one can serve both God and money. And so I don't think Jesus is saying we can't spend money on these, these items in the list here. I think what he's saying is we need to check our hearts and check our priorities and ask, ask ourselves, what's more important to me? Is it keeping up with the Joneses and having all of these comforts and luxuries? Or is it realizing that my resources have all come from God and I would like to spend them in a way that honors him and, and where I've actually brought him into the equation and, and considered what matters to him when I've started spending. So I think we need to do that. I think we need to um, understand that Jesus wants us to be content with what we have, whether it's little or lot. And so we need to ask the hard questions. Um, and, and I'm wondering if maybe how much is too much to spend on these things. I'm wondering if that's maybe not even the right question to be asking ourselves. I think we might be better off to ask questions like, how much am I willing to give up? How much am I willing to sacrifice in order to honor God and care for others? Um, and, and even, would I still have contentment in my life if I didn't have this particular luxury. Totally. So we have one more question in this category, and I'll try to be really quick with this. It says, why are there so many poor, hungry, and dying people if Jesus tells us to take care of the poor and needy? How can we be caring for widows and orphans better? <clears throat> I'm going to try to answer this really quickly, because if you know me, I'd be happy if we talked about generosity every Sunday morning for the rest of our lives. Um, this is a reference to James 1 27, where uh, it says, you know, true religion that God loves is taking care of orphans and widows. Um, and basically, the, the verse is saying, you know, if you want to please God, take care of those in need. The Bible has countless references to giving to those who are in need. I've often thought if, that if you just took all the spiritual and theological references out of the Bible, you would just have a textbook for giving. Cover to cover is a book about generosity. The, the big picture is wrapped in generosity. I agree with Talisi. I mean, the question of balancing a first world lifestyle and uh, giving, generous giving, is, I don't think it's the point of the Bible. I think the Bible actually would present a huge imbalance there um, and would always encourage you to err on the side of giving rather than thinking about yourself. I hope when you guys read the Bible, sometimes you come across passages that just punch you in the face with conviction because I've had some of those. I want to share one of the passages that's in my life has challenged and shaped so much of my life more than a lot of other passages. It comes from 1 John 3, 16 to 18. It says, this is how we, we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. I talked about that for a while, but basically it's saying, if you're a Christian, you need to be willing to lay down your life and everything in between for those, of, those around you. Then it goes on, and this verse, this is the verse that really did it for me. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother and sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Wow, that is so intense. This verse is saying that the love of God is evidenced as being alive in you if you have the ability to take care of those in need and you actually do it. The verse is saying, if you don't take care of those in need, is God's love really in you? And this shaped my life because I was like, I'm not doing a very good job of that. I have to be honest. And so I was like, God, I need to do this because I want your love to be alive inside me. And then it finishes off in verse 18. Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. This verse is saying, actions speak louder than words. I think it's awesome that we get together on Sunday mornings and sing songs about how awesome Jesus is. I, it's great. I mean, it's the first point in our uh, four-point strategies. Think big, come together, do big church. It's so valuable. But I think even more valuable than our words is our actions. And in Matthew 25, Jesus clearly tells us how we can do this. He says, if you give to those in need, if you give away, then you're giving to me. And he's saying, that is how you show me that you love me. He wants to hear that you love him, but he wants you to show him that you love him. And that's such a way that you can do it. So when it comes to tithing and giving, I agree with Doug. There's no legalistic standard, but my answer is yes. When Jesus came and made the church. He died for the church, his bride, his body. It's an opportunity to be able to give and invest into this thing that he started. It's not a legalistic thing. Question shouldn't be how much can I get away with not giving, but how much, how can I grow in giving? I'll tell you two quick things that I think giving has really shaped in my life. There's more, but first of all, I think it's really changed the way I approach my finances. Um, 
I, I think it's made me a lot more intentional since I approach it with generosity. We have way less financial stress and worry in our lives. Not because giving makes you rich. In fact, I think it makes you poorer. But, um, but because since we're being more intentional and trying to apply God's wisdom, it has shaped how we approach it. And secondly, maybe more importantly, it's helped us unlock the joy in giving. God is generous, and there's so much joy in that. It's been cool for us. We started out tithing 10%, and that's tough sometimes. That's really tough sometimes. But over the years, we've been like, you know what? This has been such a cool opportunity. How can we grow in that? Can we give more than 10% to the church? And then beyond that, can we give to missionaries or to, to friends or to people in need or to starving children around the world? And the answer is yes. And because of that, there's so much joy in that, and it's amazing. So I could never encourage you. You want to know what God's will is for your life? Give. I think giving is one of the best ways to comprehensively fit all four things into one action. If you give, you're thinking big, small, in and out. I, I need to stop talking. I'm just going to go for hours, okay? Um, I mean, we're second service, so we can go as long as we want, right? As long as we're up by 9.20 next Sunday, okay? <laughs> Move on to the next question. Talisee, is swearing a sin? If so, is it okay to use replacement words? All right. Um, interesting question. Kind of subjective. Everyone has a different opinion on this. So basically, for me, the easiest way to answer it is just to look at what the Bible says again. And so I would look at Ephesians 4.29, which says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. So for me, there are two really simple evaluation tools right there that you can use to kind of think about, you know, how does my, how does my language line up? First of all, is it wholesome? And second of all, um, does it build others up and benefit them? Um, and then the next chapter of Ephesians kind of ups the ante a little bit, and it says, nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but only thanksgiving. So this is Paul talking to the Ephesians, and I think what he's saying to us and, and ultimately to, you know, you know, us as Christians, I think we need to um, recognize that we need, our, our words have a lot of power. Our, our words can do a lot of damage. James chapter 3 actually talks about about the tongue as being um, a restless evil full of deadly poison. So some pretty strong words. Um, and I think just saying like our words have a lot of power to, to do some serious damage and we need to be intentional with the words that we're using. We need to be um, careful with the words that we're using to ensure that we are building others up. We are, we are honoring God with our words. So I think we need to be careful. I think it goes back to motives, which we've kind of been talking about all, all morning, our heart and where our heart is at. Um, and I think, you know, is it sin or isn't it sin? I believe that selfish motives are always sinful motives. So um, I think we just need to check, you know, why am I using these words? Is this about fitting in or feeling accepted or being cool? Or are, are my, is my language really about honoring God and, um, and, and showing him that, you know, I, I value what he, his word says. So, um, yeah, replacement words, again, what are your motives? I remember when I was a kid and people were using the, the name of God as a swear, and I was just a child, and I had been taught all my life that that was wrong, so I didn't want to do that, but I also wanted to fit in. So I remember, like, thinking, well, if I can come up with a replacement word that sort of sounds like God and, and kind of just, like, trail off at the end, then, you know, maybe people will think I'm cool. So for me, that's a sinful motive where I was really just looking out for number one as a child. But um, on the other hand, if someone is thinking, you know, I really want to clean up my language and I want to do that because I, I want to honor God and I value him and I want to build others up. And so I'm going to use replacement words. I think that's showing someone really cares about what God says and, and desires to honor him. So I would say that's to be commended. All I can picture now is like a young Talisee, like, oh, sod, or oh, my gourd, or I, like, I don't know. That's, pr that's pretty yeah. much it. So. Gourd's the new swear word around here. Awesome. We'll just move right on because I think we have just enough time to fit one more question in. All right. Uh, this next question, uh, is it okay for Christians to drink alcohol? So maybe first of all, uh, I think there's a lot going on with this question, um, but maybe first of all, Doug, you could talk a little bit about what the Bible says about drinking alcohol. Okay. Um, really quickly, if, if you just do a cursory specific look at scripture in regard to drinking alcohol, I think probably I could make a better case for drinking than not drinking. You're going to come across passages where, for example, Paul says to Timothy, uh, take a little bit of wine for your stomach, stomach's sake and things like that. Uh, but ultimately you're going to end up, I think, with uh, Ephesians 5, where it says, do not be drunk with wine. Uh, and so the point there being, if, if the 
limit the line is don't be drunk, then it would imply that everything up to being drunk is okay. Uh, that's where you cross the line is when you become drunk. So that's specifically where Scripture speaks to that issue. Yeah, for sure. Now, we're going to unpack this a little bit more, and I'll be honest, this isn't like the type of topic that we're like, oh, yeah, this would be really fun and a good way for us to make friends if we talk about this on stage, because there are different opinions here, and I, th this is a difficult topic. Um, and that's for two reasons. One, there's been a debate for years about whether or not Christians should drink. And I think in that debate, there are people who are responsible with Scripture, who approach it responsibly. And then I think there's some people who take Scripture and really try to push their agenda by twisting Scripture. And so they debate, you know, on both ends, whether you should or shouldn't drink. You know, and there's the debate. Is the Hebrew word yein and the Greek word oinos, is that actually always talking about a fermented alcoholic beverage, or is it not? And I don't think over the last 2,000 years that debate having happened is going to be settled here this morning at FBC. Um, for sure, it's true that the Bible says that for sure drunkenness is wrong. That's, you know, and, and then again, that brings in some ambiguity because just like in the back of your Bible, there isn't a list of swear words that you're not allowed to say in 21st century North America. You know, it also doesn't come with a guide that's like, well, 0.08% blood alcohol content is the line, or 0.1%. You know, there's no breathalyzer attached to your Bible when you get it. It's like, if you blow over this amount, you are currently living in sin. Um, you know, so for us, we say, you know, like, if, if it's talking about drunkenness, you know, is that slightly relaxed? Is that buzzed? Is that tipsy? Is that blackout drunk? Where, at what point is that fairly ambiguous uh, line? And so anyways, that is like a big debate that people have. And for me, I, I don't know if that's ever going to get really settled on those grounds. And so I'm going to step away for that for, for a second. And what I want to say is I, I want to share with you guys just for a couple minutes with as much grace and compassion and as much humility as someone who struggles with pride can share with um, the reasons why in my life as a follower of Jesus, I've chosen to not drink alcohol. Now, hear me loud and clear. I have a lot of friends who love Jesus, who drink alcohol, and, uh, you know, they, they have areas of their lives that convict and challenge me, and we have different opinions on this. Uh, you can talk to them. I'm not constantly trying to convert them. You've never heard me talk about this on stage, but quite a few people asked about this, so we want to share with it with you. And so we have a little bit of a biblical foundation. I'll share a little bit of my opinion, my take from where I'm coming from. All I'd ask you to do is listen with an open mind, whether you're a drinker or a non-drinker, or you're figuring that out. Um, and, and partially I ask you to listen with an open mind, maybe because it impacts that area. It's really not the be-all, end-all if it does. But I think the principles would apply to a lot of areas of life. Um, first of all, I just want to talk a little bit about what alcohol currently is in our world, because I think we need to paint that reality before we can have the discussion, at least from my perspective. Uh, alcohol um, is, is, is one of the leading causes of preventable death in North America. One of, one of the main reasons for preventable death is alcohol. Uh, I have a bunch of stats. They're from the U.S. because the U.S. always has better stats that are more updated. So, But usually it's pretty, um, with this type of thing, it's usually about the same over in Canada, um, just population-based. Except in this, I guess, maybe it could be argued might be a bit more because our drinking age is younger. But it was every year in the United States, there are almost 90,000 alcohol-related deaths. Um, and that's where alcohol is a significant cause. In 2012, over 10% of children had at least one parent who had uh, an alcohol problem. Uh, alcohol is a huge contributor statistically to crime. FASD is on like a crazy upswing. Um, and about 10 years ago in Calgary, I worked at a homeless shelter, and it is crazy how many lives have been not only ended, but destroyed and families destroyed by the substance. And, you know, and... I, I agree with what every drinker out there is thinking. That's because they're not drinking in moderation. You're right. And that is an irresponsible use of alcohol. But that is the reality of alcohol in our world. So I want to approach it kind of from that vantage point because that's how the scope I think about it through. Um, I want to cast your memory back to our Ask It series in, uh, which is confusing because it almost has the same name as this, but in the fall, the Andy Stanley series. And um, if you remember, we largely referenced Ephesians 5, 15 to 16. And I'll paraphrase it, but basically it says, be very careful how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. The series is always about making the wisest, best choice. And we said that goes beyond morality. You know, for sure, something immoral is not the wise choice. But you have to consider your context and say, what is the best choice? Because for me, it's true. Someone can say, you know, with alcohol, with drinking, the Bible doesn't say there's anything wrong with it. Or with certain swear words, the Bible doesn't say there's anything wrong with it. And I would agree. But for me, that's not a good enough standard as a follower of Jesus who gave his life for me. For me, the standard should be, what is actually the best and wisest and most productive thing that I can do in my life? 
So for me, I look at the reality of what alcohol is doing in our world. And for me, I say, you know, the main... Now, I know that there are some health benefits to, to ways you drink alcohol. Most North Americans don't do that, so we'll leave that debate to the side if that's okay with you. But for most part, it's a leisure activity. Um, and so for me, I'm just like, you know, that's a small sacrifice. There are a lot of other beverages that taste really great in the world, like water. Um, and, uh, and that's a small sacrifice I can do to not be involved in this arena that is destroying a lot of lives. Um, I'll give you two quick reasons why I don't want to be a part of that as a follower of Jesus. And again, you know, you can serve here at FBC if you're drinking within moderation. I mean, if you're getting drunk all the time, then we're going to have a different conversation. But, um, and this is an open conversation. If you don't like something I say, you disagree, come talk to me about it. I, I'm happy to have different opinions than people. Um, one of the main reasons I do this, alcohol is destroying a lot of lives. I don't think there would be a lot of debate if, based on the statistics, if I said, do you think our world would be better off without alcohol? Most people would have to say, well, probably. Now, it's true that probably people would find something else to destroy their lives with, but it is a destructive force. There are industry, there's a whole industry, there are companies that are making a lot of money off this. Again, that's not their direct responsibility um, because, you know, they're not making people to drink irresponsibly, but people are making a lot of money off of something that is destroying a lot of families and a lot of lives and, and killing people. So for me, we're talking about giving. I want my money, everything that God's given me, to be used as responsibly and wisely as I can into an investment into the future to honor God. So for me, I would rather spend my money somewhere else and give it rather than spend on something that is A, expensive, and B, contributes to something that I just don't feel is the best place for me to be involved. Um, and the second thing, too, is my impact on others. Now, Again, hear me loud and clear. I don't think if you drink, you can't bring people to Jesus. But I know that there are people out there, non-Christians or people who are weak in their faith, who think culturally that Christians don't drink or shouldn't drink. And that, and I have talked to people who, you know, think that. Now, that's their problem. They're being judgmental. But I can't necessarily change that overnight. What I can do is respond to that reality. And so for me, it's simple for me. The Bible says, you know, we should be above reproach, avoid the appearance of evil. So for me, that's a really simple line to step across and say, you know, I'll just do without. It's a little bit safer. Um, also, too, I think about how many people in the world do have alcohol problems and how many problems it's causing. I don't know who I'm drinking in front of. I don't know who I'm drinking with. I mean, I do kind of know, but I don't know who in the, in the future is going to have an alcohol problem. I think about my child that's coming in December. I'm so excited to be a dad. I'm going to do the best I can to be a good dad, which probably isn't that good of a promise coming from me. But um, one day my kid may have alcohol problems or step into sin or whatever with that. And if they do, I guess, my best guess would be that I'd like to think that I had nothing to do to contribute to that. And that, that applies to all avenues of life. So I need to watch how I live my life because that will impact my child and that will impact their future. And so again, I, I'm not saying if you drink, you're a bad parent. Um, but what I'm saying is that those are some of the reasons why I choose to not drink as a follower of Jesus. I don't know if you had anything you want to add to that, Doug. Uh, yeah, really, really, really quickly. Um, I, I, I just, for myself, I can't limit my review of scripture to that specific topic without weighing it in the balance of everything else that I find in scripture. And so for me, I've drawn a similar line where I won't drink. Uh, and I come to verses like 1 Corinthians 10, 23, where it says, all things are permissible, but not all things are wise. And I have to weigh that, this topic in, that, in light of that same idea, same, same axiom. And I just can't find anything that's wise enough or worth enough in drinking for me to do it. And so as a result, I draw a line and say, I don't do it. Right, and I, I think right now this is actually an important thing to think about, and not because this is a central point. We don't have like rules and policies here at FBC, even as, a, as staff. I think it's important to talk about because in one year, I think we're gonna have the same discussion about pot. I mean, really, the question is gonna be the same. A legal substance that, if used in the right way, is mind-altering, and I'd say one difference is it's actually not as addictive as alcohol. Um, and, and so as Christians, we need to not just let culture happen and like hope that our lives end up in the right spot, but I think proactively respond to that. Now, again, these aren't the biggest issues in the world, and I don't want you to think in a year from now that this is going to be a big divisive issue or anything like that, but challenge you to kind of process these things and think about how you approach that, because to me, they're kind of the same topic, except if anything, I think the Bible would say less about being high than about being drunk. So, um, that's the best we can answer that with hopefully as much grace as we can. Uh, like I said, the conversation's open. We're still friends if you drink, promise. Um, 
there was, uh, we were going to close up, but there was actually one last question that came in last minute. Um, it just out of nowhere. It says, today's date is June 11th, and it seems to me like there's something significant about Ryan, that. Ryan, we're date. over time. Uh, I think we got one we more We got to wrap this up. But I just can't quite figure it out. Can you help me figure this out, please? So, Doug, do you know what's significant about June 11th? Nothing. Zero. Absolute zero. Talsi, you have any idea? Oh, it's Doug's birthday. <laughs> Would you look at that? What'd you get him, Neil? As Doug gets a little older, we thought a half a bran muffin would be bran. Good choice because <laughs> of his age. Yeah. Should we sing for him, Ryan? No. Let's sing. Yeah. Happy birthday. This is actually amazing because it's actually Neil's birthday tomorrow and he's out here just celebrating yours. So, Listen, I just want to say you guys are awesome. You guys not so much. <laughs> it was all Talisy's idea. Thank you guys so much. We'll see you next week.